to this second uh, webinar organized by the Association of Fetal Maternal Medicine Specialists of Nigeria, AFENSUM. Um, for those of you that are hearing about AFENSUM for the first time, it is the, an association of um, subspecialists in fetal maternal medicine. And it is a part and component of the bigger one, which is SOGON. Uh, so we've been uh, having webinars to educate ourselves on fetal maternal medicine. This is the second one. And um, we just have an hour. We're not going to waste too much time. Um, we better introduce the presenters. Uh, the two presenters today are Dr. Collins Okoro, who will be presenting from the UK, and Dr. Ehiga Inabudoso, who is uh, presenting from UBTH Benin. So once more, I welcome each and every one of us. I will hand over to the presenters. If we have uh, comments, questions, we write them down. And at the end of the presentation, there will be opportunity for clarification. So um, the floor is open, please, Dr. Ehiga and Dr. Uh, Okoro. Thank you so much. I forgot to introduce myself. I'm Professor Jamila Tukur. I'll be chairing uh, on behalf of uh, Professor Apolabi, who is the chairman of the education. All right. So, good evening, everybody, once again. I am Mehiga Inabudusu. I practice fetal maternal medicine at the University of Benin and University of Benin Teaching Hospital. So today we'll be dealing on a very important topic in fetal medicine and that's fetal echocardiography. Essentially today we'll just be talking about the screening, the cardiac screening examination. So part of the objectives of today's presentation will be to introduce us to the cardiac evaluation using ultrasound. Then we'll also be able to explain certain aspects of fetal cardiac anatomy using ultrasound. We'll be looking at the understanding of the basic fetal heart sound screening targets, the ultrasound features of a normal fetal heart scan, and then to demonstrate the basic ultrasound fetal heart screening. So why is this important? It's important, cardiac fetal, fetal uh, echocardiography is important because fetal heart abnormalities are among the commonest fetal anomalies. They can also be easily detected by ultrasound. They may also help to lead to prenatal management decisions. Some of them can actually be treated. So it's important for us to do it properly. It's also part of good uh, practice principles. And then it can also give some confidence from the clients, especially those who have a bad history or increase their risk factors. And so a good Peter uh, uh, heart scan can give them some degree of confidence that their pregnancies are making significant progress. So what does it take to do a fetal echocardiography? You need a good knowledge of the heart anatomy and physiology. Some of these things we'll be talking about as we move on. You need, just like I said at the beginning, you need reasonable ultrasound experience and dexterity. The movements for cardiac scanning are very subtle, very subtle movements. The baby itself is small. They are not talking of the heart. So for you to master those subtle movements, you need to have some reasonable ultrasound experience and dexterity. You also need a good ultrasound machine, which is cardiac setting. So a lot of machines these days, like the very good ones, have a cardiac preset. We will see all this with some of the short clips that we have. Then a Doppler too, a color Doppler is also of advantage. Then the depth, zoom, and focal point, which are adjustable. These are all part of it. These are taken as routine anyway for many of the scanning machines that we have these days. There's something that's important. If you have to do a cardiac screening exam, natural fact, fetal anatomy survey, you need to have a high dose of patients. 
if you are not patient, you will get angry and you walk away from the baby. As most parents will say, the babies don't post for the camera. They just do what they want to do. They are happy to play around. So you've got to be patient. You don't query them for not um, posing for the camera. You query yourself for not being able to follow them. Why should we do a cardiac screening uh, examination? This should be done as part of the 20 to 22 week fetal anatomical survey, what we call the anomaly scan. In certain high risk circumstances, especially in those areas where we do a lot of uh, nuclear translucencies, but I having a nuclear translucency at 13 weeks of greater than 3.5, it's usually advisable that you could do an earlier fetal cardiac screening because if these patients do not have Down syndrome, we also know that they have an increased risk of cardiac uh, abnormalities. But also if the patients come in beyond 22 weeks, it's also good practice to still look at the heart. So we're now moving slightly into the nitty gritty of what we need to discuss today. Remember I said, one of the good prerequisites for a proper fetal echocardiography is anatomy. Now, this anatomy, as you start doing cardiac scans, you will keep relieving it over and over and over again until you get used to the cardiac scans. Therefore, you must understand how the baby is in the uterus and also how the heart is in the chest of the baby. So if you look at the, the side of this, I just show a short clip a very short clip. For us to have an idea of what a cardiac scan looks like. Okay, so now what we intend to show here is this. Now for the heart, when the heart is on the on the, in the chest, you need to understand how this heart is on the chest of a baby. And as we go, we need, we need to understand some basics of the anatomy of the fetal heart, because that enables you to understand every view that you eventually have. This is a, a good example of the four chamber view, but we'll show a bigger example as we move on. But some things to note here, are just some of these things. They look subtle, but they are important for you to be able to understand the heart. So at this line here is the four chamber. This is the line, the transverse line, the transverse view of the four chamber view. You will see the right ventricle is more anterior than the left ventricle, but the left ventricle shoots out a little bit more than the right ventricle, especially at its apex. So the apex really is formed by the left ventricle, but more of the anterior aspects are of the right ventricle. But I said, we'll see this a little more as we move on. So for the basics of the fetal scan, what are the things that are expected? One of the very things, first things is this, you need optimal views. Each of these ones will be taking them in turn to explain them. They need to also understand the fetal orientation in the uterus. You need to be able to identify the heart in the chest cavity, ensure that the fetal heartbeat is present, then you must get a good transverse plane view of the heart. Each of these, we're going to break them down one after the other. So remember I said, we need optimal views, we need to understand the orientation, and then all the others will follow through. So in terms of the optimal views, this gives us an example. This is a baby inside the uterus. And then these are your scan. This is your scan. And these are essentially like the rays that pass through the fetal heart. And as you do that, based on the movements that we would describe, you're able to see the various. So you can see the very subtle movement. This is the heart here. So you need to be taking slices of different aspects of this heart. So that tells you that your movements must be extremely subtle. So for the optimal views, what are our aims? The aim of our optimal view is that the cardiac view must cover 
between 50 to 60 percent of your screen so we call this optimization you must optimize your image so close to 50 to 60 percent or even beyond that and for you to achieve that you need a combination of depth and zoom you use the highest feasible frequency i didn't say possible frequency but the feasible one but the good thing is that most scanning machines these days have a cardiac preset and with the cardiac preset they are able to give you the optimal uh, frequency that you require to examine the heart. You also will use a narrow sector angle. I'll be showing some views, some clips to show us what the narrow sector angle looks like. The cardiac preset will talk about that. Use of this, use of the sign loop is also a big advantage. So you can see some of the clips that I have there, they are with using the sign loop. So with the sign loop, you're able to get like a few seconds of scanning and based on that, you can stop it and you can scroll backwards and look at some of the features that you are interested in. Then the M mode to demonstrate uh, cardiac activity. As I said, all this will show in the course of this uh, presentation. So if we look at this, this is the regular one. And then on this side, this is using the cardiac preset. So you can see that this looks brighter than this. And then this is the sector angle that we we'll talked about. So with the sector angle, you're able to achieve a greater percentage of the screen of the heart being on the screen. This is an example of the M mode. So this is the M mode. What you do is that once you have the heart on the screen, you can click on M mode in your machine and this line comes out over the heart and then you click enter or um, set, and then you have this clip. So based on this, and if you save this, then you can prove that as at the time you scan this woman, the fetal heartbeat was present. Also as part of the basis of the fetal heart scan, it is better for you to scan the heart with the apex at the 12 o'clock position. That's ideal, it makes it easier for, it makes it sharper your views sharper and clearer but any other position is okay remember at the beginning i said that fetal especially ultrasound really is pattern recognition so over time as you keep seeing and seeing and seeing heart views you're able to tell that this heart looks normal and they're also able to say no this doesn't look normal there may be something abnormal here so whatever views that you have even the 12 o'clock three o'clock or nine you sweep enables you to get from one to the other so you have a transverse sweep first at the heart then to the abdomen and then to the various transverse planes which we'll also talk about. The longitudinal views are optional. So this is the cardiac view. This is about two o'clock position. The ideal will be for you to get at about 12 o'clock position. That's the best. But even at three o'clock or nine o'clock position, it's also fine. So in terms of the techniques, what are the things that we're interested in? Usually for the cardiac scan, the view, that you require is the transverse view. So you need the transverse plane at the thorax for you to be able to do a proper cardiac screening evaluation. And once you do that at the transverse view, you'll be interested in the presence of the heart. There has to be a heart within the chest. I remember about a year or two ago, we scanned a baby and found that the heart was outside the chest cavity. So you need to know that the heart is within the chest cavity. You need to check the heartbeat the position and the axis. We'll talk about all these. And when we have time for the clinical demonstration, we may also talk about that. So once you have it at the thorax, following that you slide cordially. Now I'm using some terms in ultrasound, but we need to, that's why I said that you need the firm basis of ultrasound to be able to follow this, especially with the speed at which we are going. So you slide cordially to get the abdominal circumference view. So you see the stomach, there's a reason for that. So you can tell the situs of the scan thereafter you slide upwards again to get the four chamber view 
and then from there you slide gradually to get the left ventricular outflow view, then the right ventricular outflow view. All these we are seeing here. These are the outflow view. Thereafter, you get the three vessel view, and then you can get the aortic arch view. We must not forget that when you are doing the fetal echocardiography, you must confirm the fetal heartbeat. You can use Doppler, so you can use the pulse wave Doppler, or you can use the M mode. The M mode I've already shown. This is an example of using the pulse wave Doppler to evaluate the fetal heartbeat. So with this, you can also prove. So instead of using the M, M mode, you just click on the PW on your system, and then this line comes up with the gate at the heart, within the heart cavity, and then you click set and then you're able to show this. So with this, you can prove that the heart was beating at the time that you scanned. So going into the scan itself, I have tried to, since we talk about four chamber, four everything, I try to make everything look as if they are in sets of four so that we're able to remember. But before we move on to the general thing, there is the pre-general, which I'll put in here. You must check for laterality. Now, laterality, what you do essentially is to be able to have a view of how the baby is within the uterus. And based on that, you can now tell whether the heart should be anterior on your screen or posterior or to the left or to the right. I do hope that we'll be able to show this when we start uh, the scanning. So there, thereafter, you have the situs. Again, We'll uh, expatiate on all this before we finish. Then after the pre-general, I now entered what I call the general. In the general, you need to first of all tell us about the site of the heart. So it should be within the chest cavity and what is its position in the chest cavity. Then you must look at the size of the heart. You look at the orientation, including the axis, and then you look at function of the heart. Thereafter, we now enter the four chamber view. So all this, the sighting and all that, you can do all that using the four chamber view. But specifically at the four chamber view, you check all these things, which we'll show later. Thereafter, you move on to the aortic and pulmonary outflow, and then the three vessel view. So looking now at the, for the laterality, as I said, you will view the baby within the cavity. How we normally teach this is that we take a door. So when the woman is on the couch, you examine the baby as a door within the uterine cavity. And with this door, um, I think I have one here. So I'll put on my video now so that uh, we're able to see that. Um, okay. But then that will, okay, no, that will be a bit difficult since I'm already sharing my slide. So you will need to start looking at that separately. So there is no need. We'll make, when we finish, we may do that. So you just look at laterality and based on that, you're able to tell where you think the heart should be. So you don't always assume that the heart is on the left or on the right. You must use that laterality to tell whether the heart is on the right and on the left. Then the sighting of the heart, the positioning. So this gives us an idea of how the heart is on the chest. This is the left side of the chest. So you can see that majority of the heart is actually on the left side. Only a slight of a little part of it is on the right side. Then you now look at the axis of the heart. The long axis of the heart makes an angle of about 45 degrees to the line that you draw between the, the, the spine and the sternum. The line between the spine and the sternum divides the body into the left and the right side. So the majority of the heart is on the left side. There are abnormalities in which this will not be. So the heart may be pushed further leftwards as you could have in um, diaphragmatic hernia where the liver herniates into the chest cavity. Or in one of the pictures that we show later, you see cecum um, congenital abnormalities affecting the fetal lungs in which 
the fetal lungs are enlarged on one side, and so they push the heart through the other side. All right, so we're now going to the four chamber view. This is the most important cardiac screening plane. With this, it's said that 60% of major cardiac malformations will manifest with the fetal with the, at the four chamber view. So at the four chamber view, we'll be interested in the heart size. As we've said, the heart should cover one third of the area of the thorax. Also the heart circumference. So you can measure the circumference of the heart, usually about 50 to 60% of the circumference, actually circumference of the circumference of the chest. The site and the position and the axis we've already spoken about. So this is an example of the four chamber view. So once you have a good view of the four chamber view, you first of all draw an imaginary line. Remember, as I said, it's all pattern recognition. Once you see it and you have seen it so many times, you can have a good idea whether this is normal or not. So this is the line from the spine to the middle of the chest anteriorly. So this is the long axis which passes through the interventricular septum. So if that line, the line through that meets with this first line, you should make an angle of about 45 degrees. So usually you say 45 plus or minus 20 degrees. That's normal. So that's the first thing you look at. Then you also look at the, the size of the heart. This is about one third of the area of the chest. So this is an example, this is a live example of what we're talking about. So you can see this imaginary line from here to the front and then this line here. So this makes about 30 to 40 degrees, an angle from this uh, mid sagittal line. So also looking at the four chamber view, there are so many features that you must check for in the four chamber view. So you must check for the, this is the left ventricle. Remember, as I said, the left ventricle is the one that actually touches the apex. That's the left ventricle. This is a right ventricle. The right ventricle has what you call, so there are some trabeculae and some cardiac muscles towards the apex of the right atrium. And that's important for you to be able to identify morphologically that this is the right atrium and then this is the left atrium. Then you also have the left, sorry, the right ventricle and the left ventricle. Then this is the left atrium and the right atrium. Approximately the left ventricle is equal in size to the right atrium. This is looking as if it's bigger slightly because of this trabeculous muscle that we see at the apex. But generally, if you were to look at these whole sides from here, they are approximately equal. The same thing with the left atrium and the right atrium. So on the four chamber view, these are things that you must see. Then you also would see the, the valves as well. So you have the tricuspid valve from the right atrium to the right ventricle. Then the mitral valve from the left atrium to the left ventricle. Then this is the interventricular septum. And then this is the interatrial septum. So if we show a clip, you will see that in the interatrial inter septum, you see it flap open. That's the, pri the primum septum, the primum, um, the foramen ovale is there as an opening between the left atrium and, or rather between the right atrium and the left atrium. And then it flaps into the left atrium. Also, if you look at this view properly, this doesn't look so clear here, but sometimes you're able to see, you can at least see this. This is the left pulmonary vein draining into the left atrium. There are usually four of them, but in a good view, you're able to see between two and three of the, of the pulmonary veins. Then just behind them, you will see the vessel, that's the descending aorta. So these are among the things that you must look out for when you are carrying out a, a four, when you are looking at the four chamber view. So remember the four chambers, then the interatrial, the interventricular septum, then the 
the valves. So when you do a clip, that's what I'm talking about, the sign loop. With the sign loop, you're able to move backwards and you're able to see the clips opening and closing. One important view that you must know here is this is what is called the crooks. At these crooks, you have the primum, the, the or the intellectual um, septum, you have the primum part of it inserts there. Then the medial aspects of both valves insert there. And then the muscular aspect of the interventricular septum also inserts there. So it's a very, very, very important junction. One thing that you must also take note of is the fact that it's not a straight line. So the inter, the mitral valves and the uh, tricuspid valves, they don't insert at the same point. The tricuspid valve is more apical than the mitral valve. This is very important. By the time you see it as a straight line, that's a major, major, major abnormality, an abnormality of the crooks. And that's very important. So it is good to always make sure that you see this. It is called the offsetting. So that we can also see on this image, it is offset. So once you see the offsetting, you do know that this is a normal thing. Unlike if you see it as a straight line, that is not normal. So there are a few other things that you are expected to also check in this. So once you have the, a good four chamber view and you have looked at that, the next thing you want to do is to slide a little quarterly to go and look at where the stomach is. So you should be able to identify that the stomach is on the same side as the chest. Once you see that, you have already established the laterality by determining how the baby is lying in the Womb, so you can know which is the left and which is the right side. So for the situs, you want to know whether the heart is on the same side as the stomach. If the heart is not on the same side, then you can make a diagnosis of dextrocardia. It means that the heart is on the right side, whereas the stomach is on the left side. Or if it is situs that's the problem, then that's situs inversus. So there are two different things. In situs inversus, all the left side of the body on the right side. But in dextrocardia, the, the situs of the baby is normal, but it's just the heart that is facing the right instead of facing the left. All that is important. In this case, you can see that this heart has been moved laterally. This is an example of CCAM. So the lungs here are enlarged. Those are the lungs, and then they have pushed the heart to the left side. So if you remember the four chamber view that we just showed, you saw that the interventricular septum was intact. In this view, you can see that there is a defect in the interventricular septum. So you have a ventricular septal defect. You can still see the offset in here, so that's good. You can see the valves opening here, so that's the tricuspid valve opening. So you can also see, see this image. So this is made clearer using Dopplers. And so with the Dopplers, this is still the interventricular septum. So remember I said, you could scan the heart at 12 o'clock position. This is 12 o'clock. This is nine o'clock position. And then you're able to see that there's a defect because you can have a communication and the Doppler is showing that you have vascular or you have blood flowing between the two, chamber, the two ventricles. Thereafter, so you can see the pattern which was born. We looked at the four chamber view, then we slide cordially to go and look at the stomach for us to determine position. Then we return back to the chest again, have the four chamber view. Then from the four chamber view, we slide gently or we angulate gently, careful lad, to be able to see the outflow tracks. So the outflow tracks will now display in turn. The first to display is the left ventricular outflow tract, which we see here. The left ventricle flows into the atrium, into the aorta, and the entrance to the aorta has the aortic valve. So in the live view, once you see that, you see the left ventricle and then the blood flows into the aorta. Then as you move slightly again, um, careful lad, you see the right ventricular outflow tract. There's what they call the crossover 
they move in opposite direction. The left ventricular outflow tract, as it gets into the aorta, moves towards the left ventricle is on the left, but as the outflow tract comes out, it moves towards the right. Whereas for the right ventricle, when the outflow tract comes out, it moves towards the left. So it therefore means that there's what you call a crossover. That crossover is important to be able to differentiate between certain conditions like a like a truncus, like truncus arteriosus, where you just have a truncus across both uh, ventricles that carries the blood. Unlike in this case, it's where you have the aorta and then the pulmonary trunk. You also could have a situation whereby both vessels, uh, both outflow tracts are swapped. So you now have the aorta apparently coming out from the right ventricle, and then you have the pulmonary trunk from the left ventricle. As you still move kephalad, the next thing you also will see is what you now refer to as the three vessel view. I remember my prof then in training used to call it the dash dot dot. So what you have is the main pulmonary artery, which comes as if it's a dash. Then you have the aorta, which is essentially like a cross, um, a circle, and then you have the superior vena cava. So they also, this is also appears to be the larger, the largest one, then this is larger, and then this is just large. So that's how it goes. The main pulmonary trunk being the biggest, then the aorta, and then the superior vena cava. So this is essentially what we close to what we describe. This is like a dash, and then this is like a dot, circular, and then the superior vena cava. Then if you move a little careful lad, you will now be able to see the pulmonary trunk getting into the ductus arteriosus, then the aorta moving towards the descending aorta, and then you may also see the superior vena cava. And then just above that, a bit towards the right-hand side of the aorta, you may see the trachea. Now, this is just an example of the longitudinal view, but this is optional. It could help in diagnosing conditions like coarctation of the aorta, but it's not taken as one of the views as necessary for a cardiac screening examination. So we'll be making arrangements now for us to have our live video. But as we make arrangement for that, let me see. I'll stop sharing now and then see if Dr. Coro can make his presentation while we get ready for the live demonstration. So Dr. Coro, um, Dr. Wumi, please, you can um, ask him to unmute and let's see if his volume will be better this time around. Thank you very much. So get ready for the live demo. Hello. 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 Can you hear me now? I'm not sure what's happening. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen now.
All right. Can you confirm that you can still hear me? Yes, we can. All right. Thank you very much. All right. Good evening, everybody. I'm sincerely sorry for the technical hitches. Uh, well, I guess we are here now. So uh, Dr. Namdoso has already set the ball rolling. I'm just going to talk about uh, uh, stay on the same topic, trying to stress the importance of us doing uh, or getting involved in performing pita echocardiogram. So I will start by looking at the burden of congenital heart diseases. So congenital anomalies generally uh, account for 25.3 to 38.8 million disability adjusted life years worldwide. And the WHO body of disease study reports that anomalies alone rank number 17 among the causes of death. And then coming to heart disease, congenital heart abnormalities, they are the most common birth defects and it affects about one to 2% of all newborns that are born worldwide. Now, in the last, uh, in the last few decades, there's been a general reduction in, or at worst, uh, that's very constant, I mean, of uh, congenital anomalies generally. On the other hand, since 1970, the incidence of congenital heart uh, defect has, in, has increased about two times compared to what it is. So that stresses the importance of us getting involved or getting in, uh, to know what to do in order to diagnose these conditions. And congenital heart anomalies, like we know, has no, uh, uh, does, uh, has no uh, predilection for any uh, group. So it is common in the high income countries as well as the low income countries. And it's a major contributor to infant morbidity and mortality. And it is the second leading cause of death in the first year of life outside infectious diseases. Now, let's look at the body in Africa. In the developed world, there has been quite a huge stride in making diagnoses and intervening when there are uh, problems, but these have really not been achieved in, in the developing world, especially in Africa. The, why in the high income countries, for example, about 85% of children with congenital heart defects survive to adulthood. The same cannot be said for the low to mid, uh, middle, middle income countries. The mortality rate in this part of the world is still very, very high. So that is something that we need to pay close attention to. The WHO has reported that about 500,000 children are born each year with major congenital anomalies, and the bulk of them are in the sub-Saharan Africa. And the vast of the majority of these children receive either suboptimal care or no care at all. Now, there was a study in the northern part of the country which reported that of 1,312 patients uh, aged between nine days and 35 years with abnormal echo, 9.3% of them had congenital heart defects. So it is pretty common. Now, looking at this uh, chart, the, the chart on the left talks about the, uh, the looks at it, the global mortality from non-communicable diseases. And we can see from that chart that congenital heart defects is the leading cause of mortality among the under fives. And then the one on the right just looks at the change in proportion of death from congenital heart disease uh, relative to other non-communicable diseases. Now, if you look at that, the very top column talks about the, the global estimate. There's been a reduction in the global estimate, but the same cannot be said for low uh, to middle income countries and low income countries. Then also looking at this, in 2019, the global age or age mortality rate from congenital heart disease was 2.8 per 100,000. Well, if we look at Africa, I just want us to pay attention to the, uh, the map of Africa there. Now, 
you will notice that mainly the sub, uh, uh, the uh, western uh, uh, the sub sahara region the mortality rate is still quite high and that was below the global estimate and also in this next chart again this looks at the drift in terms of what change uh, the rate at which there's been a change between 2019 and uh, uh, between 1997 and 2019, again, we can see that in Africa, Nigeria inclusive, there has either been either no change at all or still start, uh, relatively stagnant. Now, what are the risk factors for congenital heart diseases? I'm not going to go through everything here, but I'm just going to pick some few things. First, uh, one thing I want us to note is that congenital heart disease is a multifactorial thing. It has a combination of both genetic factors as well as environmental influences. So all this, we need to be aware of this when we are counseling women. There are medications, those that are on anti-epileptic medications, for example, they are at risk of uh, developing congenital heart defect. And of course, we rubella, I know rubella, uh, Thank God there is the MMRO vaccine now, but congenital rubella has, uh, is noted for problems with pulmonary arteries, ASDs, v VSDs, and PDAs. And then of course, nutritional status of the woman is very important. Lack of essential vitamins have been implicated in high incidence of congenital heart disease. And of course, folic acid, is one of the one of the things that have been implicated, and then maternal hyperglycemia. We are all aware of that. Now the question is, who should be screened for heart malformations? I think the most important thing we should pick from this slide is the very first thing there, and that is that everyone, every woman, should be screened for congenital abnormalities. This is important because ninety percent of babies that are born with congenital uh, heart defects are born to, pay, uh, to parents with no obvious risk factors. So if we want to stratify by just looking at those with risk factors, then we are going to miss out 90% of these babies. So we need to be screening every woman. It has to, it, we need to inculcate this as part of our standard obstetric practice. Thank God the, the East, Eastwork is currently working on guidelines on first trimester uh, scanning. And one of the things that they are introducing in that guideline is checking the heart during our first trimester scan. Like, of course, in some countries, there is routine first tri trimester, uh, trimester scan between 10 and uh, 13 weeks. Now they are, in, they are insisting that we need to be looking at hearts of these women at that time. It is interesting to know that 50% of problems congenital problem generally that we can detect at 20, which can actually be detected at the first trimester scan. So we need to start cautiously looking at this. Then the other thing to look at is the increased nuclear translucency. Now, it is important we know that as the nuclear translucency increases, the, the risk of congenital heart defect also increases. Now, this chart was from one of the work by Nicolaidis and uh, colleagues. And we can see there that as the nuclear translucency increases, the number of heart, the percentage of patients with heart defect also increases. So we need to be aware of that. And then uh, uh, among these other things, I, I'll just look at, at parental first degree relative history of congenital heart defect. I'm sorry, I'm rushing, I'm trying to, keep to time. Now, the background risk of congenital heart defects is about 1.1%. But in a situation where you've had a previous relative with, okay, let's say if you've had a previous either parents or siblings with congenital heart de defects, that risk increases to 2 to 15%. In fact, it is, with, if you have same sex twins, that risk is 14 times higher than background risk. So we need to be aware of that. And then also the presence of other heritable uh, chromosomal or genetic problems. I've specified Nuna syndrome 
Nona syndrome is one of the rasopathies that is in, mainly inherited as autosomal dominant. It means that if you have a, a parent with Nona syndrome, then there is a 50% chance that a baby can have Nona syndrome. Now the risk is lowest if the inheritance mode was sporadic. If the baby develops, uh, in other words, the parents are fine, or it's just happening for the first time, then the risk of recurrence is low. Then, if we want to carry, if we want to be carrying a screening for congenital heart di diseases, if, what are the things that we need to achieve this? First, I've written that the, a, we need a quality and resol uh, the quality and resolution of equipment use is very important. Thank God, there are quite wonderful machines these days. It, it's almost look like we are looking at the baby face to face. So the resolutions are pretty good. So it will be worth investing in, in such machines if we want to make our, diag uh, uh, our diagnosis more uh, easier. But in addition to this, or, or even most important, is the, is the skill and experience of the ultrasound practitioner. Now we know the sensitivity of a scan machine is as good as the person operating it. If the person operating it is not skilled or experienced, then it's, it's as good as nothing. It doesn't matter if the, the, the scan machine has perfect resolution, is the best in the world, still will not be able to achieve anything. So it's therefore important that the experience and skill of the practitioner is, uh, is put into consideration. And then facilities for appropriate intervention. One of the key criteria for, uh, for screening according to WHO is availability of facilities for diagnosis and intervention. It is useless making a diagnosis if we can't intervene. So if we are going to set up an effective screening for congenital heart disease, we also need to be looking at intervention management. What do we do when we diagnose conditions? And then MDT involvement. I'm still going to mention MDT involvement as I carry on. We can never underestimate the role of MDT involvement. We can't work in isolation. It is not just about you being a fetal medicine practitioner, you can scan, uh, you can diagnose anything. That is not just uh, that's not just it. You need to work with others. These babies, what happened? These women, they, they face a lot of uh, trouble psychologically. They need someone to support them. And then your baby, uh, the babies that are going to come out, someone is going to treat them. So all that need to come in in our uh, program. And then there need to be established policies and protocols that helps to regular. I think so, such that everyone does similar thing in the sense that we have a practice. This is how things are done. It has, it, that will help us both for auditing as well as ensuring that we maintain uh, quality. All right, I'll just quickly go through these. What are the challenges that, are, uh, that we face? In Nigeria, in terms, as far as congenital heart disease screening and diagnosis is, is concerned, first, we don't have diagnostic facilities. Yes, there are, scan, there are scan machines, but the question is how many do we have? What is the ratio of the diagnostic facilities we have compared uh, to the number of pregnant women? And then skills, do we have the requisite skills to operate these machines and make a, an appropriate diagnosis? And then I mentioned this earlier, we don't have established policies and protocol. How are things done? We, we have a situation where different people do things differently. And of course, that's, with that, we just cannot move forward and uh, establish things. And then lack of prenatal education. But there's been studies to say that some women do not assess antenatal uh, uh, care because of either this, because the, the care is just not available or because sometimes because of their uh, beliefs. And then our, our health structure is not functioning. The, it, having an effective screening is not just about the tertiary hospital, the various 
level of the, the heads, the primary, at the, I mean the primary level, the secondary, the tertiary, all need to be functioning. The at the tertiary level, they cannot get the body alone. We, we saw from the, the charts I showed that the rate of congenital heart defects is quite on the high <clears> side. <throat> so it's just not something for the tertiary hospital. The whole structure needs to be formed, need to be properly uh, formed. And then political commitment. Again, this, or I would say, underpinning the whole thing about uh, these challenges in terms of, in the sense that our politicians are not concerned about this. As far as this is not their priority. And so, based on that, there is low investment in health sector. I think in the uh, cor current, uh, there is uh, currently uh, the president recently presented the proposed 2023 budget. And in that, we can see that only a very low percentage, I think about 5.75 uh, 5 of the entire budget was allocated to head sector compared to 15%, which was the AU agreement. So, the question is, how do we move forward? How do we, uh, with that? No, there need to be political commitment to this. And then social, cultural and religious factors, I've mentioned that. And then lack of ancillary services. Like I said, it is not just making diagnosis. There need to be, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to be facilities to treat these patients when diagnoses are made. So therefore, what are the things we need to put in place in the start, or how do we establish congenital heart defects care? Now, I will look at it from various arm. Um, first, preconception. We need to be identifying risk factors. What are the risk factors in these women? Which of them can we modify? We need, we need to start preparing these women before they get pregnant. We often don't have preconceptional care clinics, but that is one of the things that can be done at the primary care level. So we need to be looking at this. And then for those women with uh, fatals that, are, that we cannot do anything about, they need to be referred early so that these are the sort of women that can be referred straight to the fetal medicine uh, practitioners where they can plan them for detail scan to make diagnosis earlier. And then when they are pregnant, we need to make diagnosis. This is important because it helps us uh, to improve our counseling of this patient. And it gives them an opportunity to decide if they want to continue the pregnancy. And for those with complex abnormalities, for example, if they want to terminate the pregnancy, and then, then they can have that. And also, also important is that it guides their timing, mode, as well as optimal location of delivery. Some of these heart defects and can uh, are not what and uh, not what you want to just deliver at any health center. You want them to be delivered in a place where they can have intervention as soon as possible, or at least they have good neonatal fa uh, facility where uh, these babies can be moved straight to the neonatal intensive care and handled. So the only way this will happen is if we have quite a, if we are making this diagnosis during that later period. And again, it also allows appropriate planning and consultation between the cardiologist as well as the neonatologist. Again, I mentioned MDT. Again, I'll keep, we, we, we need to, to allow that continue to resound in our, in our mind. We cannot establish a congenital heart defect care and indeed, fetal medicine as a whole, we cannot establish a fetal medicine care with that MDT. So we need to have inter-specialty uh, involvement. We need to discuss with people. We need to sit down, have a discussion. What do we do? How do, uh, do we man uh, manage this patient? If the, if the couple choose to carry on with the pregnancy, what happened? How will this baby be managed when the baby is born? Is it going to have surgery? Where is this? Uh, surgery going to take place, all that needs to happen. And then when these babies are born, then again, diagnosis comes in. Currently, a lot of our diagnosis from, from, uh, from evidences that we have 
a lot of diagnoses are made either when these patients, when these babies come in very sick or even post-mortem. That's, that's sad. Some of these conditions can be diagnosed when these babies are born, either uh, from their uh, physical signs or sometimes because uh, when we auscultate their heart. So we need to be looking at, uh, we need to, be in, uh, to invest in training of midwives, training of nurses so that they are able to make this diagnosis. And then I've talked about treatments. They have to be centers. Now, is sometimes we need to, we don't need a necessary need to have everything in the same center. Sometimes it may be a, in a completely different center, but that's where inter-facility collaboration needs to come in. We know that UBTH is, uh, it has pediatric ca cardiac center, uh, uh, loots, does these other things. So if we have this certain condition, we know that we are going to transfer this uh, baby to UBTH or to loot or to somewhere. So we need to have things like that. And then support. This is one of the most important things. When these diagnoses are made, these women face quite a lot of psychological challenges. It is not easy. Even when they opt to carry on the pregnancy, they need quite a lot of psychological support. And if they choose to terminate the pregnancy because there's a, the uh, defect is complex, that also can teach some persons in, into uh, uh, depression. So they need quite a lot of support. Now, I will conclude my presentation with making some recommendation. Of course, I talk the role of political commitment cannot be over overemphasized. Then I'll just talk about development of low cost pro, uh, policy for provision of future emergency services. This has been uh, uh, tried in some African countries and that has worked very well. We need to be looking at this in Nigeria. It is also useless having the best ultrasound machines of, or having the best skills in the world if these women cannot afford to pay for these services. So we need to be look, looking at this. And then also we need to be developing standards in training of ultrasound practitioners. At the moment, it, it does, it, we, people do things differently. We need to set standards for those that are going to be, to be performing obstetric scans. There need to be minimum standards that we expect. So these need to be incorporated in their training so that we know that when we get a report, we, we are reasonably sure that we are getting the right thing. It, this doesn't have to be just obstetricians. Sonographers, we, in fact, we have some uh, midwives getting trained in, in scans. That also helps to take off boarding from, uh, from the obstetrician. Then I've talked about inter-facilities and inter-specialties collaboration. We need to have MDT approach. In different facilities, we need to be communicating. Okay, we have this, we are sending, uh, what make a plan for delivery. Is this patient based on the uh, diagnosed congenital uh, uh, defect? Where would be the best place? Can this patient deliver in our facility? And then we can transfer afterwards to facility where this child can have care or does this baby require immediate care as soon as uh, the baby comes out? And in that case, then it means that this baby is, uh, will, it will be better to deliver this baby in the facility where such care is available. We need to have this collaboration. And lastly, the role of registry and reporting of cases. There should be a national registry where this, where congenital abnormalities are, are reported. This helps both for researches, it helps for auditing. It also helps us to identify risk factors. If, for example, we recognize that certain conditions are predominant in certain area, then we, there could be some public health interventions to look at that area. What is peculiar in that area? Why are we having these particular conditions coming from those area, and then we can uh, the necessary intervention can be carried out to try and uh, reduce the incidence of such. So at this stage point, I would say thank you everybody for listening.
Uh, thank you very much. I want to thank the presenters, uh, Dr. Ehiga and Dr. Collins for this uh, very elaborate presentation. And uh, I want to really appreciate, I think um, you've really covered most of all, all what we need to know on this important topic. I want to use the opportunity to recognize the presence of the presence, uh, president of uh, Atemson, uh, Professor Etuk, Prof. Etuk, you're welcome, sir, and many other distinguished participants. Um, Dr. Higa, please guide us. Are you still going to do a scan? Dr. Higa, you mentioned doing a live scan. <laughs> yes, yes. So, so if you check your your screen now, you will see the the view of the. Um, I think somebody's uh, somebody's screen just came up, so I don't want that. It needs to show the screen of the scan. Please, whoever, I don't know where this uh, new screen came from. It should be off because you need to see my screen that I'm going to use to scan. This desktop screen, where is it from? Otherwise, um, you won't see my screen. Okay. <coughs> Don't give me, let me see how I can get this screen out. Those We're ready for this scan, but we must get this. That it was this seven, six, six. Hello. It was five o'clock. Okay. You must have okay. the internet. And so I don't know who owns this one hour screen before. so that I can. So I felt it will be six o'clock our time. One hour from Nigeria. Yeah. Only to realize that no, actually Nigeria is ahead. So five o'clock. So let me unmute. Oh, no. Um. And so the Jamil, you wanted like when you're using your hand again. I need to unmute you then. It's a presentation on the. So my the, screen is on now. Okay, okay, so I'll okay. start the scan <laughs> so that we can have a nice. Yeah, I, think, I saw your phone. I thought so. I was going to just messing with you. Just no, like that I, so I, I said so. I thought the initial I wanted to say. Okay. All right. So I think I, I should have at least one person on mute. Yeah. So, yeah. Dr. So I told Jamil, you. can you raise your hand so that yeah. I can see you quickly and then unmute you if you are not unmuted? Please raise your hand. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Do you want me to say or we want to go to um, I think I have done my presentation. Uh, uh, because then you save yourself so three more hours of you know, reflecting my work and you know. Okay, so I'll ask you to uh, unmute. <laughs> All right, so you're unmuted, so you'll be giving me a feedback. I've done my presentation. What's going on? Yes. I just interviewed. Yes. Can I hear you? We're going into session. Dr. Higa, can I hear you? But there's some background noise. I'm not, I'm not sure. Yes, can you hear me, Higa? Yeah. But I'll, I'll just tell them that. So. All right. But there is some, so. there's some background so, noise. That's why he's standing. We have an idea. So I'll go back to the. So this is the routine view that we normally would use to scan. So for a routine view, we usually will scan the baby, do a routine scan. So we find that this is the bladder. This is the head, so this is a carefully presenting baby, and then the placenta and the life. So having done all that, usually we now assume. So you now check where the back is. So this back, the back of this baby is towards the mother's left side. So you now assume a baby that's lying with the head down and then with the back to the left side of the mother. Do we get it? So on that basis, it therefore means that the right-hand side of the baby will be anterior and the left-hand side will be posterior in the abdomen. Um, I usually like a feedback. Well, Tuko, please just be answering so I know somebody's listening at least. So having done that, that's what we call the laterality. Once you have established that, then you now check and see whether it falls in place and see where the stomach is. The stomach is towards the back of the mother. So this is the stomach here. 
this is the stomach, so we know that the situs of the stomach is okay. Then we'll see the heart, so we will put on our end mode, put the end mode around the region of the heart, click set, and then we have the end mode tracing. So we can usually save that, so I will know that yes, at the time we scan, this baby was alive. So we now go to an appropriate preset. So we now go to the cardiac preset. So we can see the cardiac preset with higher uh, frequency. And then we can see what we talked about as the sector. So I will see the sector. You can actually increase the size of the sector. So that is it. So we can see the heart very well. So based on this, you can see that the heart is a bit away from the 12 o'clock position. It's about seven o'clock position. So a little more difficult. So now we have to do some movements of our probe to see how we can get the heart to a better position. So this is about 40, of, uh, of about 40 percent of the of the chest. So we increase it so it occupies close to about 60 percent. Then the first aim, as we said, we can see the heart. So we can freeze here to see whether so it's okay. It's okay. So if I freeze. And then I put a line from the anterior to the posterior. Or oh, let me so I can see the yeah. So that's the intervention, that's the interventricular section here. So what I'll just need to do is to be able to get a line. So let me just use this. So this line here this is the back, and this is the sternum. So if we look at that, we need a majority of this heart is towards the left hand side. So based on that, we know that you're and then you can see this line here making an angle of close to about 40 degrees to the line from the sternum to the spine. So that means the axis and the position of this heart is okay. So let's continue our scan. So having done that, the next thing you want to do is to do a four chamber view. Now, most times they say one of the most difficult things is for you to do a live demo aside for these small structures because the babies can decide to just mess you up. But I think we are getting some reasonable view here. So, based on the views that we get, this is the so we can see the functionality. They are both um, contracting in phase. So, this is the left ventricle. This is the right, right ventricle. And we can see that both of them are about equal in size. Okay, so we can see the interventricular septum is intact. If we look well, we can see the valves flapping on both sides and then the offsetting. Reduce the gain a bit. So if we look well at the offsetting, we can see that the tricuspid valve is slightly more apical than the mitral valve. So what I need to display more now is the the atrium. This is the left atrium. You can see the pulmonary uh, vessels getting in, and then the right atrium. This is the inter interatrial septum. I hope you all believe me, but you can see the interatrial um, foramen, foramen novale, with the flap entering into the left atrium. So let's put color and let's see how the blood flows here. So that's color. So let me freeze and use the sign loop. So the right, the right and left ventricle, you can see them. And then you can see blood flowing from across the foramen novale. You have to look here. The left ventricle, the left atrium is here, the right atrium is here. So I will scroll back again so you see the blood flowing across that. Can you see? Yes, we can. So that's from the right atrium. To the left atrium to the foramen novale, and then we can see blood flowing from the 
I'll show you again from here, the right left atrium into the left ventricle. So again, I will show you it using the sign loop and then we'll be able to see that. So we can see. So these movements are so subtle. So you must, if it's a pattern recognition, you must have seen them before and be able to tell that this is what it is. So already I can see the outflow that's trying to get into the atrium, the aorta. So I'll continue the scanning. So once we have the four chamber view, we slide a bit capella toward the head. So the head is down on the woman. Now you can see the limbs keep coming in and now we are seeing that the baby is no longer cooperating. But yeah, that's a good four chamber view again. As I said, this is one of the very difficult things that <laughs> most times even in conferences, people hate to do this because sometimes it makes people to wonder where do you get a certificate from if you can't even do a simple scan. Well, it's so difficult as, uh, so, okay, good. That seems to be a good one again. So, as I said, maybe don't post for the camera. So if we look at this, the inside ventricular section, we're able to see more clearly. Okay, so, all right, so you now scroll, um, slide towards the apex. And as we do that, now we can see the, the limb here is coming into the stubbus, but now it has just left, so that's fine. So very subtle movement, subtle movement, and occasionally you may have to do some Some rotation, slight rotation. Okay, so that's fine. So this is the dash. This is dash. That's the pulmonary trunk. Dot the aorta, and then the superior vena cava. Now, if we still move upwards, this one just gives us a good view. As we move upwards, we can see. It is coming up and then the subdivisions into the left, right, and left pulmonary artery. So, again, let's attempt that the four chamber view again. You can see the outflow tracks. So, I'll freeze again now. So, let's go back. I think, yeah, this is a three vessel view. Let's move backwards. I'm scrolling back three vessel view again. You can see it. So, the larger one is this, then this, then this is smaller. So I'm scrolling backwards, scrolling back, scrolling back. So we can see the outflow here. But I said very tiny thing. So you must have seen it before for you to be able to identify them. So this, there's no overriding here because the, the aorta is the continuation of the interventricular septum. Please just believe me. So that's it. That's a very good one. Now we can see the outflow here. And then you can see the outflow from the other side. That's the crossover. I want you to look at this place. You see one outflow here, and then you see another outflow there. So that's what we call the crossover. The left ventricular outflow, then the right ventricular outflow. So I will show you it again. That's the left, that's the right. And then as we scroll downwards, we'll now be able to get to the four chamber, the four chamber. So that's the four chamber view. So quickly again, okay, this is a bit nice. So the baby has turned to a position that we wouldn't have loved. So that's it again. <coughs> so again, we look at the stomach. The stomach is on that same side. That is the stomach. And from the stomach, we get to the chest. That's it. So this covers about one third of the area of the chest. So it's eyeballing. Most times you don't bother measuring those things. And then as you scroll upwards slightly, oh, beautiful. That's the, that's the three vessel view again. So you can see how the sign loop, how important the sign loop is. So we can see this here. And as we move upwards, it will get a full view 
then okay, this under good uh, three mesodium. And then if we follow this, this is the aorta. This is the, oh, the hand has come in again. Yeah, this is the, this is the pulmonary trunk and then the ductus arteriosus. So this aorta continues to join it so that both of them can now form the descending aorta. I hope that with these few words of mine, I've been able to convince you that it is possible to do a feeder cardiac screening examination. Thank you very much, Professor Tupo. Okay, before I just uh, hand over to you, just a quick appreciation to Dr. Okoro. I think he's on call. I have to make sure that he makes his presentation. So he has to run out of his call to quickly join us. He is presently practicing in the UK. So Dr. Okoro, I deeply appreciate your being able to make it. And then I want to thank especially one of my own, Dr. Shirley, who helped with my slides in making my slides look much better. And I thank FMC for this opportunity. And I'm handing over back to Dr. Professor Jamil Tukor. I give I thank you all for having given me the opportunity to be with you. Thank you very much. So I will ask Professor Tukor now to unmute. Okay. All right, sorry. I've asked you to unmute. Great. Thank yes. you very much. I really appreciate you all. Thank you very, very much, Dr. Higa in Abudoso. This is a very, well, very you can talk now. Well, I can I'm, I'm talking. I hope you can hear me. Uh, on behalf of our family, I really will I really wish to appreciate this lucid and educative presentation. Um, I think you've taken us through what we need to know on fetal echocardiography. And I'm sure all the participants have benefited from this particular uh, presentation. Uh, with, this was supposed to be one hour uh, webinar, but now we've almost reached one and a half hours. So um, all the same, we welcome one or two questions. So if anybody has a question, uh, I don't know that we can unmute now, we can unmute the participants so that they can participate. Um, you can raise your hand and then we'll, um, you know, we'll, we'll recognize you and you can ask your question. So any, anybody having a question, you can raise your hand, please. Or you can write in the chat box too. Is there any question from the participants? Um, I don't know that the participants have been unmuted. Okay, somebody, they have to raise their hand so that I can unmute. Okay, so please, if you have a question, raise your hand first. Okay, yes, Professor uh, Abe is putting up his hand. So you can unmute now. Then Shego, you can unmute. And um, Professor Ande, ah, that's my teacher. So, sir, I've asked you to unmute. Good, good evening, sir. Good evening, Dr. Abia. Go ahead, please. Yeah. Good evening, everybody. Yeah. Good evening, my seniors and colleagues. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I lost my voice. So if you're not hearing me very well, I'm sorry about that. But there is a very good lecture that was delivered by Dr. Nabudosu. So my question, what I want to talk about here is, are there different level of fetal echocardiography? It seems that what was presented is, is, is more associated with the UK guideline, whereby they do the aortic uh, origin, um, two, um, three vessel view, two vessel views, and you move on. Are there in Nigeria, are we going to establish level of specialization in fetal echocardiography as we go on? We start with the basic, then we start with the next level. Are we looking into that? Okay, can we take more questions, please? Uh, Professor Andy, please go ahead. Yes, Professor Andy, please go ahead. Well, we can hear Prof. Andy. Good evening, sir. 
Okay, yes, go ahead. Yes, share with Victor. Yeah. Share with Victor. Uh, yeah, no, no. Can you hear me now? Yes, I, I was not able to unmute myself literally. A good one. Just to say one, I think this, this is very, very important and appropriate for what we are planning for the maternal features of the church. This is very good. And the question asked has already said the template, which enabled also we answer. We know there are different levels. But I believe this level we are talking about is the basic, which the average person in maternal medicine, some specialty should be able to give. And if there are issues, we now raise up to other levels, just that Dr. Okoro mentioned. Well, one thing I noticed, which I want us to remember, is that these things we are doing are going to serve as resources for training and on which we will build up the source specialty. So I will plead that the, I think it's the VP2 that is in charge of academics and documentation to please let's keep these things so that we can use it for training and from there also build up on it. So congratulations, Dr. Enabudoso and Okoro, and of course, a firm thing for sustaining the spirit we are in. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much, you, sir. Shago, you raise your hand. Please go on. I hope I've asked you to unmute previously. Let me just check again. Uh, Shago, Victor, unmute, please. I'm on mute. I'm, I'm on mute already. Shago, Victor. Yeah, good evening, sir. Yes, I'm on the way. I'm on the Okay. I can hear you, sir. Can you hear me, sir? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah, thank you very much for the wonderful presentation. I I then make me due to our area uh, condition, I mean Lagos uh, situation. I was in the trap before the way, but I, I just like 30, 20 minutes ago, I was able to meet up and uh, meet some oh. vital information at vital points. But I just want to ask that oh. Hello, sir. Yes, I'm hearing you. Yes, and I just want to ask, are we going to, is this uh, presentation going to continue? That is only my question because I really miss a lot today, but I, the, the little time I, I joined, I was, I enjoyed it, and I, I'm praying that this can continue, and then she's another time so that somebody can walk and watch this out and not miss it again. All right. Um so that uh, I don't forget what you have just said. Yes, the education committee plans to have these presentations every three months. So we started three months ago. Professor Jamie took us, the one who took us on Tumbo, venous Tumbo embolism. Okay. So this is the second one. There's a third one in three months' time, okay. and then there's a fourth one. All the topics have already been lined up for the first four oh, sessions. Oh. So we're having one every three months. So that was the okay. education committee headed by Professor Apolabi of uh, University of Lagos. Oh, okay, no problem. Then, um, I Dr. Abe, first of all, um, Professor Ande, thank you very much. I appreciate your kind words, and they're all well taken. Um, Dr. Abe also spoke about the issue of levels of scanning. I think we must move gradually. Um, that's why I kept using the word screening. What we have just described is really, it's not really called the screening. And then, well, the ISO guideline has just been upgraded. Previously, it said that for screening, you should stop at the four chamber view. However, it has added the outflow tracks now. Yes. So that's essentially what I demonstrated. So all that has been added. We are hoping that we can build capacity in the country if we're able to do proper screening, then we can now move on to that of theta echocardiography. That's a little more expansive. You are looking at just like an ECG. You are looking at the chambers in greater uh, in greater detail. You are looking at the valves in greater detail and trying to make a diagnosis. So when the screening is abnormal, then you will move to a higher level to do the screening. So essentially, you are talking of better medicine. You are talking of those who are better trained. And then you are looking at more specific things. Thank you. Uh, maybe before we end, it's good to just mention something that came up recently, which I'm, I have uh, put up now. Just yesterday, ISOC sent me a message concerning a special offer. I think it's showing on the screen now, a special membership offer. 
which they are granting. They said Nigeria, so I wonder why they are so nice to us. But I think it's, it should be for low-income countries, but the letter specifically said for Nigeria, and they are offering a 75% discount on journal membership for ISO. Wow. So that gives you one year membership and then gives you access to the online journal. The ISO journal, the white journal is one of the topmost journals in obstetrics and gynecology. And the fee that they have given to us is 28.75 pounds. So now many people have asked, does that worry about those who had basic membership and have not renewed for a while? They just replied me today that you can pay this as a continuation of what you had before, but this will be for one year. So you pay 28.75 pounds and you get online membership for one year. Thank you. So I know that the president, Professor Etu, raised his hand earlier and I'd ask him to unmute. So, sir, please, you can just uh, quickly address us. Professor Etu, please. Good evening, everybody, the moderator, the presenter. Mine is just to show my appreciation because it's been wonderful. Uh, I didn't expect anything less. You have gone, you have done very well. The presenters, both the, my Nabudoso, which I've, I've known you for it, and Okoro is doing very well. So I thank everybody. And then make those who are here to know that there's something like a fancy, and that's the place to be. If you are here, you should appreciate the fact that if you lean yourself with FMC, you will go, you will go places. I want to thank the, 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 the moderator. He has done very well. I appreciate everybody and say we must always remember FMC wherever we go. Thank you very much and God bless. Thank you, sir. So, Professor Tukwa, you can round us up. I hope you are still unmuted. If not, you can raise your hand so that I can ask you to unmute. Professor Tukar, raise your hand so that you can, I can see you and then ask you to unmute. Um, I'm not able to see him now. So probably I will just quickly close up on his behalf. Professor Tukar, are you there? Can you raise your hand? Just raise your hand on the screen so that um, I can ask you to unmute. Okay, I still can't see him. So I think we can actually close up. But since the president is here, Mr. President, sir, you can close us up. Okay, once again, thank you everybody for attending this uh, webinar. It's something like you've been told comes up every three months and it's done intentionally to educate us, to show us the way forward and to showcase that to showcase Afemson as it were. Today has been well spent and we thank everybody for being here and expect you in the next three months to be ready for another, another meal. Once again, I thank the presenter, I thank the moderator and I thank everybody for all that we've done today. And we say, may God bless all of us. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So I know there's a recording of this. So that recording, we're going to put it together. And then we'll send message for those who are not on the Afghanistan WhatsApp page. You can uh, 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 get in touch with the secretary, Dr. Raji from Ilorin, or the president, Professor Etu from Calabar, or even myself or any other member of the education committee. So once the recordings have been put in place, we will tell you how to how to assess the recordings so that uh, you can see. Also, the slides I will try to put them up some we'll be able to assess them and then we can go through them at our, at our leisure. The question came in to say, will the increase in congenital heart disease be as a result of improvement in diagnosis? Definitely, once you have improvement diagnosis, you start seeing things that you never saw in the past. And then somebody asked too, when should it be done? Well, I said that it's best done at between 20 and 22 weeks, but we know that for those who are very high risk, it may be beneficial to do an initial screening scan, even at about two weeks. Back. And then beyond that, you still do the one at 22 weeks. So once again, I say thank you very much.